until you can be your highest level. And then you become believable, right? And so I want to talk about the gift, the goal, then the tough part, the strategy and the process, yuck, and, uh, and then the destination. And, that's, and so I'm, you're going to hear about a couple of stories wrapped into one. Um, so I announced professional rodeo all over the world, um, biggest coliseums in the country, and, uh, and had the privilege of meeting some really cool people and doing a lot of cool stuff and some stuff I hope nobody ever finds out about. Um, but but that, that was the easiest job I've ever had in my whole life because um, I'm very comfortable right here. I'm not very comfortable where you're sitting. Like where you're sitting, I'm wiggling around. I'm trying to find somewhere to stand in the back. Or, um, but right here, man, I'm at home. And I knew that whenever I was young. I knew that God had kind of put me to where, you know, I had, I had, a, I had a gift. Um, now, I didn't know how to direct it, so I made some errors in life that, that you know, if in the church world, they may not lean into me quite so easily um, to be a pastor um, when you've had a couple wives. And, I mean, I struck out a time or two, you know. But um, So, anyway, I, I'm, I'm a... It's about three years before um, I meet Gwen, and I'm fed up with failure. Everybody, anybody ever been fed up with failure? And I don't know if it was, I didn't know then if it was my fault, their fault, whatever. Um, I learned it was my fault. But, uh, but I told God one day, I was driving to work, and uh, I had a real job. I hadn't had many of those in my life. And uh, I said, man, God, your Bible says that it ain't good for man to live alone, and I, and you know I'm trying not to live alone. <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to be married, um, but I stink at this. And uh, and so if but if, but if you but if you know I need a wife, then that means when you made me, surely you made my wife. I mean that's not just random. That's just not like happenstance. I mean it's, so. So I, I stayed right there, man. Every morning, I, I made a commitment to me and God that you know I wouldn't talk to a female, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have any relationship or any type for three years from December the twelfth that year, and and uh, and then every day on my way to work at the same spot, didn't matter what I was doing. If I was on the phone, I'd say I gotta go, and I'd hang up, and I would pray for my wife. It was twenty five minutes from there to my work, and I'd pray for my wife. And I'll just tell you, it started off being like. Um, help her to be such and such tall and such and such size and <laughs> help her to think I'm all that in a bag of chips, you know. And and, uh, and I was writing it down on a yellow notebook paper, you know, that was before you text everything in. And and, uh, <laughs> and all of a sudden stuff just started changing. But here's what instigated the change. I heard a pastor preach about being able to lay your hands on something you were praying for. Well, that was kind of difficult since I didn't know who she was. So, I got this rock, and this is that rock, and I'm going to cry. <laughs> um, and I told this rock, I said, you will be my wife that I don't know. And I'm going to put you in my pocket, and every time I touch you, I'm going to pray for the wife that I haven't met yet. And so then I had, I had, so I, I had a gift in my hand, um, and I had a goal that I was going to see her someday. So I stuck it in my pocket. And people thought, they'd go, what are you doing at Rock? It's my wife. She's hot, just so you know. She's hot. I didn't know she was going to be three inches taller than me, but she is hot. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, all those things that I had on that list started getting really insignificant. And it would be stuff like, hey, man, just, just let her like me a little bit. That'd be all right. And then that even changed. And I, I, I'll never forget it. I have eaten these words a lot. But I said, man, God, you know what? If you'll send me the one you made for me, even if she don't like me, I'll take care of her the rest of her life. That's what I said. I said, she may be married to the wrong dude. So, I mean, like, but if you let me know who she is, I'll take care of the rest of my life, even if she don't like me. There's been days when I've thought, good thing I didn't make that covenant with you. I made it with God because I might break it. Um, no, not really. It's so. Three years goes by, and uh, it's the longest three years of my life. God added some things to me, um, some young men that I got to mentor that I had no idea that they were going to teach me more than I taught them. They're all pastors now, just about, and uh, 
I didn't know what was going on, but I just knew. I knew I was on this process. During this process, um, I had a life coach, I had a pastor, I had a psychiatrist, and I had a marriage counselor. But I didn't have no wife. That's the easiest marriage counselor in the world. Because if you go in there and go, this is jacked up, and he'll go, you sure are. <laughs> Nobody argues with him, you know. But I knew that, that because of previous experience that my success was going to be based on how much I practiced before I got in the game. And, and so um, I might have had to, I should have probably practiced longer because Gwen will tell you, I've had to still learn a lot along the way, but I'm better than I've ever been. And so I met Gwen, and uh, I knew she was my wife just like that. It took me three years for her to hear God on that. She don't hear as good as I do. Um, and uh, she, she, I, I, I just said, thanks, you know. And she said, can you make him any taller? And I was like, come on, really? Um, so we got married. Um, we started off to plan a big old wedding. And it ended up being on our back porch on Facebook Live. We had about 1,000 guests. And none of them showed up in our yard. That was even better. Um, and uh, and I, like I said, I was announcing rodeo, so I had to leave town every week. And uh, I was used to it because I'd been doing it for 25 years. And when I left town, I was famous. I mean, I, I signed my autograph. People want to talk to me. When I got home, I was nobody. So I really wanted to leave town again. But then all of a sudden, I had this wife, and I didn't want to leave. And I'd get there, and I was trying to be home. And then I was at home, and I didn't want to go there. And so I'm trying to figure out how to make a living. And, and, and she was a massage therapist for 20 years. And, and so um, we weren't rich. Um, um, we, we were we, like, Actually, our budget we had then, we would be filthy rich today if we still had that budget. But... Um, but I knew, man, something had to give. I had to figure out a way to make some money because, you know, I mean, you, she can love me a lot, but broke, I'm not that pretty. So um, so we, I, I had some questions that I asked, and it led us to real estate. We got our license. We got in real estate, and, I, you know, I'm confident. I'm full of fire, and I'm like, shoot, this is easy, man. I can get in there. It's just got to do with people, man. I can sell anything. I can sell ice cream to Eskimos. It ain't no big deal to me. I'll sell it. And I couldn't find a client. Um, if I could have got a client, I could have sold a house, no doubt. But I couldn't get a, I didn't know how to get a client. I had been in a business to where the fans weren't coming there to see me. But I was still controlling everything they did, so I felt like I had some stuff. Now I'm in a business to where i got to attract them to me, not to the sport, not to the event, not to the venue. And I'm like, I don't know how to attract people. So... We joined Keller Williams and because their training program was huge and, uh, and, and I was really trying to bootleg some training. So a, a buddy of mine knew James Carpenter. I called James Carpenter. I said, hey, I need some bootleg training. Just give me, just give me the videos. I don't want to join Keller Williams because y'all recruit like crazy and you're driving me insane. But, but I need that training. He's like, that's cool. I'll give you whatever you want. Come over here, though. I'm going to meet you. And then he took me over there and, and I met Hayden Riggs, who is a big, big, big pillar in my life because he um, he convinced me that I needed to be there to grow and uh, and so we got there and we and I was there every time the doors opened and about four months later man I was filthy broke and about fifty thousand dollars in credit card debt because I didn't have the rodeos because I was gonna be a realtor and I didn't know how to get it I didn't know how, they taught me how to write contracts. I'm dyslexic, so I went and hired Angela. But I didn't hire her until after I had another moment where things changed. But, but I was dreading getting a listing because I can't, I can't do that. My brain won't do that. But, so that kind of impaired my ability to go sell, right? So um, I'm just kind of getting you up to the place where it happened. So, so, so Hayden comes to me and he says, hey, um, there's going to be an event called Bold and you and Gwen have to go. And I said, we can't go. And he goes, no, you have to. And I said, you don't understand, we can't. And he goes, it's just in Dallas, it's not that far. And I said, you don't understand, I don't have the money to go. And he said, I don't care if you gotta steal it. He said, you gotta go. And so I used five credit cards. I pulled 200 here and 300 there, you know, because that's all I had left. We paid our fees to Bold. The first time we drove up there, man, we drove through the hood of Dallas. We was lost as a goose. This sucker here fly. I fly. I don't drive through Dallas. And uh, we finally get there, and, and this guy Dusty's teaching. And Dusty and me are so similar. 
Um, we both grew up in church. He, he went to school of ministry. I went to school of ministry. He tried to pastor a role. He couldn't get it right because he was too much of a fool sometimes. Me too. I get it. He played pro tennis, so he was famous on the weekends. He was a nobody on Monday. I was in pro rodeo. Same tracks. We knew exactly. He knew me inside out just like that. And so that first day in that class, I sat there and I watched, and I was sitting beside Charlotte Williams, and, uh, and, I, and, I, and I'm offended because he's, he's talking to my flaws in a way that, like, it's kind of like whenever you go to church and the preacher preaches an awesome sermon, but you feel like your toes hurt, you know? But at the same time, man, I could feel this gift inside of me just rising up, and I'm like, I can do that. I mean, that's who I am. I'm in the wrong category. I don't need to be out here learning to be a realtor. I, I can do that today. I mean, I, people are my thing, you know? And so as it would happen, Dusty and I became friends and became more than friends. He, he, he became a mentor to me. And I told him, I said, hey, listen, um, I'll learn all this stuff you're trying to teach me, but, but I'm going to be a coach. And he said, great. And I said, man, I'm gifted. I, I, that's what I do. I get in front of people. I talk. I said, I pastor people. I do. I do I, that's my that's my game. He goes, perfect. He said, but nobody's going to hire you because you ain't never accomplished anything in real estate. And I was like, okay. So show me how to do that. He goes, how much need? How much money you got to make? And I said, I'd like to make fifty grand. He went, I can't help you. I said, what do you mean? He said, you got to think bigger. I says, well, okay, hundred. Sounded good to me. And he goes, I can't help you. You got to think bigger. And I said, well, let's just throw some money around and do 150 And he said, how about you double that? And then I'll see about helping you. You got to remember, I was raised poor. Um, we didn't know we was poor, but we didn't have much. Um, I wore hand-me-down jeans until Wrangler quit making bell bottoms, and they weren't popular anymore, so my mama could buy them for $4 at Jim's Trim, and she'd cut the bell out of the leg, and they were crooked, but they were new. And uh, we, we lived a conservative life. And I said, man, that's impossible. He said, 12 months, 300000 I said, yes, it can't be done. And he said, can you drive to New York? I said, I drove to New York. I drove to New York and now to the real Madison Square Gardens. He said, can you get there without a map? And I said, well, probably not. And he goes, well, I got the map to the money. Can you follow it? And I said, dude, I can follow a map. I'm not an idiot. And he goes, you're not going to like it. And I said, really? And he goes, no. He said, but you've got to commit today that you're going to do everything I tell you to do. And I said, I'll stand out there on the curb with a pair of purple underwear on with a sign over my head that says, Dusty is awesome if you make me make $300,000 next year. And I'm in it. And he laughed and he said, I'm not going to let you do that, but we're going to follow the map. So through that bold class, they, started, they kept throwing this stuff at me. It was strategy, right? So, so if y'all are in real estate, then, then like scripts, everybody hates. Who hates scripts? Okay, you know why you hate scripts? Because they're not you, right? Um, and so I, I'm a professional rodeo announcer. I've announced the National Finals Rodeo in Las Vegas. I've announced the PBR Finals. and Y'all don't even know who that is. Y'all could care less. But to me... I didn't need no doggone script. And, and so I was, I, was, I was rebelling without saying anything because it was just like, who does that? I mean, who does that? And then all of a sudden, he had us as a group do this together in a way to where we got to kind of own it. And it was over and over and over and over and over and over and then he says, who wants to spill it? And I said, I got it. And he came to me, and he says, his line? And I said, my version of my line. He said, his line? I said, my version of my line. He said, his line? I said, my version of my line. He said, that's what I'm talking about. He said, the script is a map. It means you know where you're headed. It's not ver you're not supposed to use verbatim words because you can do that with a voice recorder. But it's a map. All of a sudden, the lights came on. And I thought, I can do this. Because I thought it was just that simple, right? So I made uh, 500 to 600 phone calls over a period of five weeks, two people on the phone with one script. Hey, how you doing? Just checking on you. How's things going at work? Where are you working at? Um, you been on vacation lately? What do you got planned for the holidays, by the way? 
um, do you know anybody's thing about buyers on real estate that you can give me their name? And I got nothing. 600 phone calls, nothing. Because I was doing it, but I was doing it. I was dialing, 100 people a week. So I get, I get to this one room, one opportunity, and, and, and Dusty spills it a little different way because he knew how to walk in revelation, not just information. So, you know what that means? So, so information is like whenever you're teaching content. That's information. Revelation is whenever you're teaching what you know. And see, he stepped out of his little mold of, of teacher, and he went from teaching to preaching just like that. And, and I went to trying to learn to receive it. And I received something. And I went home, and I said, huh, I can do this. Saturday morning, I got up 4 a.m., 4.30. I kissed my wife on the forehead. I said, I'll be back. I'm going to work when I have a con an appointment for a real estate deal. She probably thought I was never coming home again. I started dialing the phone at 8 o'clock that morning. I dialed probably three or 400 phone numbers. I probably talked to 200 people at 1 o'clock. I had not talked to, I hadn't got one single deal. And I'm pitching the script best I can. And I got frustrated, and I just, I, I, I couldn't quit because I couldn't go home. So I got a guy's answer machine, and I said, yes, sir, Mr. Donnie, uh, this is Racer Botkin, and uh, I'm with Keller Williams Realty. It, I don't know if your house is still for sale or not. I just see it expired, and uh, if it's still for sale, I can sell it. Call me back, 903-918-3255, and I hung up. I made three phone calls in a row like that. I booked every one of those when they called me back as a listing appointment to the tune of $2 million in an afternoon. We sold all those houses in less than 27 days. Trigger. Tr that's, that's how it happens. Lead generation is, is more of a marathon than it is a race, but, it, but it's compiling. You're building, 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 building. It's like planting a garden. You go plant one watermelon seed, you'll get one watermelon plant, and you'll get a lot of watermelons. But if you go plant a bunch of watermelon seeds, it don't take but a minute, just 20 or 30 seeds, you'll be having to give away watermelons to everybody you'll have so many watermelons. That's lead generation. So... So what, so, but even still, I'm not super effective, but me and Dusty now have got this relationship and he says, okay, let's work on, let's work on your effectiveness. So we're in the process. So I, so I, I, I've seen my gift. My first gift I saw was Gwen and I did the time and I prayed. I, I went to coaching. I learned how to be a better husband. I learned how to wait. I learned how to not even be distracted by a female until I knew it was her. And I got the, I got, I achieved the gift. That was my destination. Mm -hmm. And then so now that gift is putting a demand on me because of, not because of what she's saying, but because of the way I care about her. And i got to achieve in this real estate deal because if I don't, I'm failing her. And she believes in me. And so Dusty says, we're going to work on your effectiveness. And I said, okay, what's that look like? And he said, well, um, I need you to take a sheet of paper and write down everybody that you got hard feelings with. Might need two sheets. <laughs> and... Uh, and I actually coach this way today. This is because I think it's the most freeing thing that I've ever done. It's going to help you if you do it. If you do it, you'll call me in a week. You'll call me in two days and you'll be mad. you call me in a week and you'll be free. So I made the list. And the next week, he says, you got your list? I said, yeah. He said, let's talk about it. And he made me verbally describe every one of those scenarios took a while. Some of them didn't take a very long time. I said, he's just, uh, uh, you know what I mean. He said, okay, here's what you're going to do. You call him. I said, whoa. <laughs> I said, you ain't tick people off like I've ticked people off. Like, some of these people I don't need to call. They don't need to know I'm still alive. And he goes, you call him. I said, what am I going to say when I call him? He's going, to, he's going to say, you're going to say what he said, you're going to say what gets you free. And I says, well, maybe they don't want me to be free. He said, don't matter what they want, it's about you, it's not them. And he said, and if you're not free, your wife's going to suffer. So you decide. You want to go tell her you're not going to do it, or you want me to tell her? And I was like, that's the kind of coach you need. You want a coach that loves you enough to cry with you, and, and loves you enough to say, if you don't want to do this, your obligation is not to you, it's to your wife, it's to your husband, it's to your family. And if you want me to go tell them that you're not willing to do it for them, I will. Or you can. Or you can do it. 
That's hard to swallow. So I said, fine, I'll do it. I said, what do I do? And he goes, get him on the phone. He said, you might say something like, hey, Joe, I know I hadn't talked to you in 10 years, um, and I don't need you to say anything. Just, just listen for a minute. I don't know what happened. Doesn't matter. For my part, in any of it, I'm repenting, man, and I'm asking for forgiveness. And I want you to know that I have no hard feelings about anything that went on. If I see you in the grocery store, I'll hug your neck. You can hug my neck. Or you can avoid me if you want to, but I just want you to know that we're clean, man, and there ain't nothing there. And he said, and then get off the phone. That's impossible. Not saying it, getting off the phone after you say it. Because some of them would say, I didn't know we had a problem. (laughs) And I thought, well, my little voodoo doll wasn't working, that's why. And some of them said, oh, man, that's been water under the bridge. That's been a long time ago. That's no big deal. It's been a long, but it was a big deal. Because if I was walking through Walmart and I saw that person, I'd be like, oh, man, I talk bad to that sucker, you know, or or whatever. So I was clean. Man, I I didn't have, as far as I know today, I don't have an enemy. I mean, you may not like me, but I don't know it. (laughs) Because I like you. And then he said, my next exercise that we do in coaching. Now I've taken, I, there's 12 categories to kind of your life. Like for y'all, that would be as a wife and as a mother um, and as a, co- as a worker and maybe as a Christian. You know, we're believers, with, I believe, here today for sure. And, and so, and he said, attach the names of the people that had the strongest investment of influence in those areas. So there's 12 categories. And so I did that, took all week to do that, because now you got to really think, you know, who made me a better dad? Who said stuff that made me a better dad? I had guys like Ron Knatzer, he was a cowboy preacher. He was a great cowboy, and he was a, he was a really good pastor. But he, he told me one day, he said, man, if you're going to raise them two girls by yourself, you're going to have to quit raising kids. And I says, they're nine and seven. What do you mean? And he said, you better start raising adults. They're going to work you to death. He said, you're not, you're not supposed to raise kids. You're supposed to raise wives and mamas. My daughter's standing right back here. Now, she'll tell you if I failed at one thing, is raising her, raising her, she ain't never been a kid. I did fail at that because there's got to be balance. But the minute that they started wearing panties that didn't have Dora or something like that on them, I didn't wash clothes no more. You're a big girl now. I'm not working, you know. We didn't, I didn't cook dinner. We cooked dinner. I didn't load the dishwasher. We loaded the dishwasher. I didn't clean the house, and we didn't clean the house. We, I was a bachelor with two girls. <laughs> we just stepped over it and kicked the pile. But, um, but that was a big deal about how, how I raised my kids. So, so I had all these people I put in these places, and I realized that one guy, Terry Holland, he's my cousin, had influenced 11 categories of my life. And, man, it just overwhelmed me. And guess what he said whenever we looked at it the next week? Call him. And I was like, well, that's an easier call than the last one. Now, you want to see something really special. You go through and see what you're made of and who you're made of, and you call them people and tell them thanks. So the first thing I had was humility. I learned humility. And I learned repentance. The second thing I learned was gratitude. So then, now... I'm not doing real estate stuff. I'm being repented and gracious with whatever comes out of my mouth. I'm not playing a system and a model anymore. You understand what I'm saying? I'm speaking life. And so guess what happens? So that same phone call, I'd call people in my database, and I'd go, Hey, Mr. Jones, how you doing? This is Ray Sabakin. Hey, Ray, how are you? I'd go, Listen, I don't really need to take up a lot of your time today, but you're on my list, which means if you're on my list, you're on my heart. I get up at 5 a.m. I pray for everybody I'm going to call today. And the Lord just said that I just really need to reach out to you and say, How are you and your family? And because my heart was pure and I, and I didn't have nothing to hold me back, the Holy Spirit grabs those words, and it doesn't go to their ears. It goes to their heart. And I would get answers like, man, dude, me and my wife ain't doing so good. I'd get stuff like, hey, I got a bad doctor report the other day, and I hadn't even told my wife. 
I get stuff like, man, my kids then got in trouble at school, and and uh, uh, we don't know what we're going to do with them. I get stuff like, oh, I got laid off my job. I think I'm going to lose my house. When you call people and say, how are you doing? And they say, we're fine. They're hearing you. But when you've got everything, when you got you dialed in right, and you say, how are you? And they say, I ain't good. They're hearing you. When they hear you here, you have an investment. And where you invest, the Bible says where your treasure is, there will your heart be. So where you invest, your heart will follow. And when you do the time so that you're fit to ask that question, then you've invested. And when that answer comes to that question, it doesn't matter what it is. If I need to bring you food for the next two weeks, I will. If you've lost some family member and you need help paying your bill, I'll do it. It doesn't matter because your heart's there. When your heart's there, your connection's different. You're connected this way and you're connected this way. See, the Bible says the goodness of God is what leads me into repentance. That's the only thing that it says in the whole Bible. So it's not preaching, teaching, it's not condemnation, it's not fear, it's not what if you happen to have a wreck on the way home today, you're going to die and go to hell. That does not lead people to repentance. That just scares the hell out of people. But the goodness of God, that's what Jesus did. He said, I, I came here so that you could watch me and know my dad. I'm going to do dad stuff because he's good. Jesus went about healing people. He never asked them a question. He didn't say, well, how do you believe? Do you tithe? Do you give to the temple? Are you doing right? Are you, are you acting right? No, you're sick, <laughs> healed. That's what we got to figure out. If we're going to walk this deal out correctly with power, with anointing, with the ability to say, man, God, my business is your business, and whatever you want to do with my business, I'm doing it because I'm going to be you here best I can. Now, all of a sudden, you don't get to pick and choose, and you're going to get more messy stuff. But you get to close 57 houses in a year, too. And they some of them people that was crazy. But we had a place in it. Sometimes we had a place for us to learn in it. And sometimes we had a place for us to teach in it. And it all came from lead generation. So, so, what's, so what are we doing now, right? So, so Dusty told me, man, you're going to be a great coach. I've, I've watched you speak on stage, man. I've been with you here. I've, I've seen your rodeo videos. You've got 13 pages of Google. Um, I mean, like, you can do this. And I'm like, yeah. He says, but you've got to get a record. Nobody cares what you did your fifth year of real estate. But they care the first, and they care the second, and they might care the third. But if you don't do anything there, they ain't going to know your name. And so, man, in 2020, I got up 5 a.m. or earlier. I was in my office. I left there at midnight, 280-something days. I, I had every day scheduled 15 minutes at a time. I called people so many times they're sick of hearing from me. But I wasn't calling them saying, please give me some real estate. When COVID hit, I was calling saying, hey, I'm an essential. I can go anywhere I want to. I'll pick up prescriptions, fruits and vegetables, cold beer, cigarettes. You just tell me what you want, I'll go get it. I didn't have to do it very many times, but I did it for a few. But the thing is, is I worked, I lived in an opportunity of serving, and so I never felt like I was working. You know, I just knew that if I didn't get up in the morning and do my job, somebody's going to need to talk to somebody, and I was that somebody probably, and I wasn't going to show up, so he's going to have to wait till God sent somebody else that would. And in the meantime, he may blow up with his wife or his boss or his kids and wreck a whole lot of stuff that God's going to have to put together before he gets to talk to the next guy that's going to help him to get through it. And I believe that. And so my value went up, even that wouldn't be an arrogance, I just knew that I had a gift, and if God had given me a gift, he didn't give it to me for nothing. He gave it to me to use. That's why you've got to figure out how you're put together. Um, and there's ways to do that. I, I can help you if, if you have questions about that. We'll talk about it later. But it, some people just don't know. They say, well, I think I'm a hostess, or I think I'm a, And that's because that's what's comfortable sometimes. But whenever you really do some analyzing, some testing, figuring it out, you'll realize that it may not be anything that you even like. My wife walks in the anointing of a prophet. My wife don't want to talk to nobody. But she's good with God. But 
But in her office, people will come to her without even knowing, and they'll say, I've been asking God, and I can't hear nothing. I don't want to know what to do. I just don't know. And then she has to say, if I don't walk in my gift right here, they're going to get hung right where they're at, and we're going to wait for somebody else to show up that's got it. And that could mess up their whole life. So come here, let me pray for you. Because she knows God's going to go through her because that's her gift. Now, she doesn't necessarily want that to happen, but she didn't get to pick. You don't get to pick your gift. You can't get rid of it because the Bible says that the gifts of God are beyond what's that reproach. It's, nothing takes them away. It says, And it says your gift will make room for you. So here's what I was leaning on all that time. I was selling real estate, selling real estate, selling real estate, selling real estate, selling real estate. People would say, man, nobody sells real estate like you're selling real estate as a new agent. I'm like, I'm not trying to sell real estate to be a real estate agent. I'm trying to be a coach. I'm trying to make room for that gift. I'm trying to figure out how to get my gift in the room so I can do what I do. And uh, so there were a few steps along the way that I thought, for my step. Y'all ever thought something belonged to you and then it didn't? And you went, what the heck? You know? So while I had learned a lot about humility and I had learned a lot about gratitude, um, I didn't learn about sometimes the GPS, God's positioning system. And so an opportunity arose, and I voiced that I wanted it, and I didn't get it. <laughs> and I thought, what happened? You know what I mean? What happened? And, uh, and my feelings got a little hurt. Not because I didn't get it, because I just didn't get it. I didn't feel like I got a shake at it, you know? And uh, so I, we have a prayer team that we, our, our very best people that we pay on our staff are called Apostolic Intercessors Network. Y'all need to write that down. We have five people that pray for us two hours a day, six days a week, which is about 120 hours a week. And they're not praying for, let's help my baby boy be good and healthy and not get a snotty nose. They're fighting between what's going on in the world and what's going on in heaven. And they're trying to let us hear and see and do what God wants us to do. And I've told them, listen, I'm not understanding what's going on or why it's going on, but I need some clarity or I need to know where I'm headed. And they kept coming back saying, um, we, we, that's not your spot. Your, your, your spot's coming, but that's not your spot. Your spot's going to look different. It's going to look like a kingdom assignment. It's going to look like even kingdom value and revenue. It's going to look like a place where you get to walk in your anointing as a pastor, but you're not going to have to be bound by the rules of the requirements of the church. You're going to have people that are going to come to you, and you're going to be able to impart things to them just because you're anointed to do it. Paul laid his hands on Timothy and imparted something to him. Timothy didn't have to learn it. A gift touched him, and it and, and that's what they were saying. They were saying, you're going to be in a place where you can impart to people, not just coach them. Okay. Would you give me an address? <laughs> Would you give me a timeline? Would you give me some, you know, uh, when's that going to happen? Well, we get to the first of the year, and God gives me a real lesson in... Uh, the fact that a thief will steal from you, right? That's what they do because they're thieves. And, uh, and we had lost a lot of income last year, but he showed me where I didn't lose it. I earned it, but it got stolen from me because um, where we weren't planted in a place to like call our storehouse or church. So we were givers, but we weren't tithers. And the tithe um, protects your stuff. It says in Malachi chapter 3 that when you bring in your tithes into the storehouse, that's, that's the church, that's the priest. Um, that, that God will rebuke the, the thief for my sake and that Satan cannot steal the fruit from my ground. That's what he says. It's the only place he says it. It's the only insurance policy you got over your stuff is the tithe. And I wasn't being rebellious and not tithing. I just didn't have a place to tithe, so we were giving. But a gift says if you give, cast your bread, it'll come back. Press down, shake it together, run it over. That means everything you can get in the basket, push it down as tight as you can, shake it up, stuff it again, it still falls out. I mean, that's... And we had stuff, man. We had 200 dogs in a dog breeding program. We had two big, nice 20 by 50 air conditioned cool barns. Our house had appraised for $200,000 more than it did five years before. We bought a place in the country and paid cash for it. I got four trucks. We, we had stuff. 
But we put $485,000 in escrow the year before, and we cashed every one of them checks. And this year, we put $485,000 in escrow, and we cashed $190,000 worth of checks. Because I didn't have no door locks. And for one reason or another, that stuff fell out, fell off, fell away, and I didn't ever get to lay hold of it. Because there's thieves amongst us. That will dial you in when God teaches you that lesson on a 14-foot ladder on a second story, <laughs> looking down at the floor, which is 28 feet below you, and you say, where did I miss it? And he's like, it ain't down there, buddy. But if you look over at that door, that's where it is because you ain't got no locks on it. And so we're just trying to say, okay, God, we'll do whatever, whenever, however. Whatever, whenever, however. And I'm going, I got to do something. I got to do something right now, and I got to figure something out. My wife is saying, whatever, whenever, however. I mean, you know, money's tight. Budget's not tight. Budget's $14,000 a month. Um, I was telling my son-in-law, Colton, over there, I said, you need to be saving money right now because with your income, you can save 2000 a month. I said, with my income, I got to make $15,000 a month to save 1000 so save you money while you can because it's easy right now. And, and so that's, why, that's, why, that's, that's why she's my gift, man, because like even yesterday I was freaking out because we've got these deals to deal with, and then God shows up, man. And she was, she was like, you're not selling nothing. You're not pawning nothing. You're not taking nothing to the bank. You're not, just, just be still. And I'm like, I got to go. I'm not out of there. And I come back and I go, God did that. At least I have no humility. <laughs> um, so what am I getting to? Um, how big? How big is the dream that that is connected to your gift? Or is it? Are you trying to? Are you trying to put your dream around a lifestyle? Are you trying to wrap your dream around a feeling? You know, I understand financial freedom and the release of not having to... I've never enjoyed it, but I understand it. I read a book on it. Um, but most people build their dreams around stuff that they want or a way that they feel or the way they want to feel. But what if... What if you could figure out who you really are? Ephesians chapter 1 says, Before the foundation of the world, God created Racer Bodkin righteous and holy in Christ Jesus. On purpose. And everybody is created with a gift. And your gift may not be like my gift because that would be stupid. If we had a room full of cooks, that poor sweet lady back there wouldn't have no job to do. We need a room full of dishwashers. You, you know what I'm saying? We don't need another cook. Um, God, God knows we've got to have this here and this here and this here and this here. But here's the problem. Most people don't know. And since we don't know, we go from career to career or relationship to relationship or dream to dream or car, sports car to utility car, utility car to pickup truck, pickup truck, go get a motorcycle. We don't know where we're headed. We're just, we're just trying to figure out what fits. But once you figure out who you are and how you're made, when I walked in that class, I sat there and watched that little man walk back and forth. He's the same size as me. So he's my hero right off the bat. I knew I said, that's me. That's what this is what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to teach people, coach people, impart to people, watch people grow, force people to grow, put it, make it where it's easy, make it where it's hard. That's what I'm supposed to do. I got it. And now I can't do it because I ain't sold no real estate. Well, that's great. I got a dream with requirements. Well, we sold some real estate. And I ain't real sure how it happened. But uh, today, because of the gift of my wife, Gwen, that put a demand on me to make a better life for us, put me in real estate, and because of the demand on me to make a better life for us, put me at Keller Williams. And Keller Williams, because they had a demand on me to be more than I was, introduced me to a coaching program called Bold and a guy named Dusty. And Dusty, because of the call of God on his life, 
could not walk past me because he knew I was the fit for his gift. And so I did what he told me to do because I knew where I was headed. I just didn't know when I was going to get there. But it wasn't going to be selling real estate. And for three years, I lived in this wilderness where I didn't ever feel like I really fit, but I was good at it. And I wasn't good at it because of my gift. I, good at, I was good at it because the reason I was doing it was because of my gift. And then the market goes away, kind of, and things change. And my phone rings. And she tricked me. I got a recruiter that called and said, hey, uh, Cindy Shields wants to meet with you. And I thought, I don't think I did anything wrong. I haven't done, I don't know, you know, I mean, Cindy wasn't, I mean, I, I knew her, but she hung out in the Cascades. I don't see the Cascades a lot. <laughs> um, she's got a coaching facility she'd like to talk to you about taking a tour of, coaching facility. We've been praying about coaching for six months, man. So I'm like, heck yeah, tell her to call me. So I called my prayer team and I said, hey, this lady wants to talk to me about a coaching facility. Like, I've already written the, I've done written the book. And so they're praying, I'm praying, we're praying that morning, man, I'm praying, I'm fasting that morning because I know you're going to be calling. And it's a 10-minute phone call, and boy, it's a sh narrow window, and I don't know if I'm even going to get a shot, but I'm going to take a shot. And so she calls, she goes, hey, I got so excited when I got you on the phone. I just kind of want to talk to you about some things we're doing over at the property shop. Blah, blah, blah. And that wasn't going towards the coaching direction, I didn't think. So I said, hold on. I don't know why you're calling, but I'm coach. And I ain't going nowhere for no reason except a coach. And then the Holy Spirit moved into that conversation. And I don't know what he led her to say, but that 10-minute call turned into two and a half hours. And I felt full, and she felt full. And then the next conversation was here at 7 a.m. in the morning. She said, I blocked two hours, so we got plenty of time. I left at 12.45. And then the next conversation, I walked in and sat down. I said, look, I know it's 4 o'clock, and I know you've got to go eat with your husband, so we don't have to be here long. Let's figure this out. And it didn't take but about an hour. Um, but that alignment, that process, that whole deal, 50 houses a year basically, or 150 over three and a half years, whatever you want to say, whatever you want to call it, the gift of God is, always makes room for you. And the gift of God made room for me. So I'm going to announce this to y'all first. Um, that's okay. It took me a long time to get here too, so it doesn't matter. Oh, that's not me. Um, I had nothing to do with those girls right there, I promise you. There, that's me. So uh, I get to be my gift. So, and <sighs> after I get through crying, um, you tell her if Charlotte Williams hadn't been Charlotte Williams, I wouldn't be here. Hayden Riggs hadn't been Hayden Riggs, I wouldn't be here. Keller Williams wouldn't be Keller Williams, I wouldn't be here. And let me tell you something, I didn't leave nowhere mad. I graduated high school, I still cheer for the Lobos, you hear me? I'm still a Lobo, but I graduated because there ain't no place for a 54-year-old man in a high school. <laughs> and so that's the hardest, thing, hardest phone call I ever made was Monday. And I had to call Miss Dawn and say, hey, listen, I love you. But my next season looks like this, and it's under a different umbrella. And, and I hope y'all love me as much as I love you when I ain't here, because I don't want to have to change my background story. And she said, we'll love you from now on. And uh, that's the final lesson of the day. If, if your next season, God says glory to glory, not 
not glory to the same old story. It's glory to glory. It's from good to bad. It's from bad to better to good to great to greater to greater. You know, it's supposed to be that way. But the only way you can keep doing that is you've got to keep moving. And let me tell you something. There's people in your life, including your mother and father, that will have a place for a period. But let me tell you something. That girl right there is my daughter. And when I walked her down that aisle, I knew what I was doing. I gave her to him. I gave her to him. I took my name off of her. Because if I don't release her to him, he never gets to be the head. He always walks under my shadow, and my shadow can't cover him. My anointing can't cover him. He's the man of the house. So I didn't have to have that conversation, but I had to do it in here. And that's the same way it is in life. Sometimes people are there for a reason, and if they're not there, you're never going to make it. But you've got to be willing to say, I love you, and keep moving. And, and you've got to be gracious enough if you are that person to say, I love you too, and I put my stamp on you, so keep on going. Because their fame is your fame. Their success is your success. Their children's blessing is your blessing. Because you don't get to see... The best gift of all is when you do something for somebody and don't tell nobody. And if we're not careful, we'll try to hang on to people so that we get to use their, their win. So it makes us feel like we did something. I don't need nobody to know I did it. But I get to see it. And I know because I woke up and I said, okay, God, you've called me this, and I'll fulfill it, that their life's better. And if it's one, or if it's ten, or if it's 10,000, that's what you're here for. Big deal's finding your gift. So part of the first thing we're going to do here is we're going to try to involve agents for all levels of real estate. I'm not a counselor. Um, I have operated in the office of pastor. I prefer not to be your pastor. Um, and I'm sure not a psychiatrist, but I got a good one, so if you need a reference. <laughs> But what I am is a seeker of the truth. And I, I will help you find your truth. Um, I will help you find who you are and who you intend to be. And sometimes who you think you are will have to be unfolded. And then I'll help you with a strategy to figure out how to move yourself into a training so that you can get yourself to act like you're built. You know? It'd be like trying to pull a big load of stuff with a Corvette. It's not built that way. But if you have a Corvette, it'll go 200 miles an hour. If you don't know how to drive 200 miles an hour, you're going to die. So, so you got to know how you're built, and then you got to know how to operate the way you're built so that whenever you operate correctly in the way you're built, your gift goes ahead of you and it makes room, and everything you touch changes. And that's my goal. And then we'll add to that some good practice that real estate, to help real estate work. And we'll also try to help you with the fact that you're winning. It may not feel like it, but if you're getting up and you're kicking, you're winning. And mostly, we're going to try to help you figure out that there's a place in somebody's life just about every day. That if you'll land and plant and leave, you'll shift their whole, their whole life. When you buy somebody that $2 worth of gas, she wants $2 in gas at the gas pump, and you fill it up, and she goes home. She's better to her husband. She's better to her kids because she saw God that day. And that husband might have had a bad day and going to come home, and he don't need his tail chewed out. But if he gets it chewed out, he's probably going to throw a fit, and he might have thrown something, and it all stops because she's not like that because she saw God that day. Because the goodness of God leads them into repentance, and it changes people. And so that's what I'm going to help people do. And then we're going to make goals. I'm going to hold you accountable to them. My coach said I would get up at 5 a.m. I told him that's impossible. I rode for 25 years. He said, let me see your debit card. I want to show you a trick. I said, okay. He wrote it down and handed it back. I said, what's the trick? He said, if you don't text me by 5.05, I'm hitting that card for 500 bucks. I didn't have enough self-discipline to get up at 5 a.m., but I had enough fear of loss. <laughs> I can tell y'all, if you don't start, y'all got to work out. You'll feel better. You'll look better. You'll smell better. If people like you, you got to go work out. You ain't going to work out. You let your doctor say, you don't go to work out, you're going to die. You'll be there tomorrow. Fear of loss will get you there. So as a coach, my job is to help you position yourself under the gun, backed up against the wall, where you have to perform. Because if not, if you watch that Facebook page I made this morning, you'll be like an old sock. And every time you get pulled up into place and you think you've got it, you'll start sliding back down. So 
That's who we're going to do it. And we're going to do it, and we're going to say words like Jesus. Crazy. We're going to say words like Holy Spirit. Um, and we're going to say a lot of words like I love you. If I got one gift out of all of that, God showed me that I can love every single one of you. I don't have to know you. I don't even have to like you. But I can love you. Because before the foundation of the world, God made you righteous and holy. And if you're not looking that way on the outside, it's because the world has got you in costume. But underneath all that, I can love you. And so I love you. And we're going to love on you. Thank you. Um, thank you for being patient. I don't know how long I went. Are you kidding me? I let at less than an hour? Exactly. Holy cow. <laughs> so so in, in the last last thing, so that is my daughter Shada sitting at that table. Um, she don't belong to me no more. Joe Bill. <laughs> I hate the word son in law because he's my son. His name's Colton. That's his natural hair color. <laughs> he's handsome. I can't I just can't stand him. But but so you know whenever you whenever you fight for a gift that God shows you in your head and you can't see it but you know you can get it and you keep fighting for it and then you get it and it's more than what you thought it was that's what I got so for three years I prayed I fasted I sought counsel I got education I did all this stuff I abstained so I would have the gift of a wife and I got a mother-in-law that's amazing and that's Ruth Ann back there and uh, that's, my, that's maybe my greatest gift because she loves me just like her son. And I told my mom, I said, I hope you're not offended that I call her mom. She said, I've been waiting on some help your whole life. <laughs> but uh, that's my crew, and that's, that's what I'm made of. And that's why we do what we do. And, so, uh, and you'll be my crew too because, see, now anybody that shows up here, I just adopt. And... and you just all you gotta do is ask, and I don't have every answer, but I have a lot of strategy, and that's all. That's that's what a good mentor does. A good mentor helps you figure out the problem, or figure out the the, the win. Figure out, you know, and uh, I can't make a football player run any faster, but I can push him down a hill where he can run faster because his body will make him. And so I may have to push you down a hill, but we'll get you running faster. And uh, you're and then the more you run downhill, the more you'll learn to run faster. So. We'll do whatever we got to do, but that's what we want to do, and we want to do it in a way that's classy, um, and we want to give honor to everybody that, that has ever been a part of what we do and who we are, and when y'all walk out of here and say that place is awesome or that was fun or we had a great day, that honors us, and we just want to honor you because we know you're going to do that because that's the kind of people you are, so thank you for being you, and we love you. If you, if you got any questions later, come talk to me. I'll be around because uh, I work here. <laughs> <laughs>